The legwork of this research was done by James Lindsay via these videos. More information at the end of this video. Why are companies suddenly flooded with DEI departments and inclusivity initiatives? Why are people being canceled left and right for nonsense reasons? Remember the race riots after George Floyd or the takeover of Seattle a few summers ago? Once you know the reality of DEI, that's diversity, equity, and inclusion, and CRT, critical race theory, then it will all become crystal clear. If you're here for the short version, it's this. DEI and CRT have their roots in Marxism, but the people who support them want a revolution based on racial power dynamics instead of on class struggles, as Marx thought. However, the true history begins before Karl Marx and the Communist Manifesto. We're going to build it up from the bottom while clarifying the buzzwords and catchphrases along the way. After you see the history and the rationale, you'll understand why CRT is being shoved into schools, movements like defund the police aren't what you think, and this begins and ends with Christianity. Each major branch of philosophy builds on previous ones in some way, whether affirming or rejecting them, and the history of human thought goes back thousands of years. But the whole history would take way too long. So we'll start with a man named George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. While some of his ideas really originate with people like Immanuel Kant and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, it was the life and death of Hegel that lit the fuse of Marxism, so the credit mainly goes to him. In 1807, he published the book The Phenomenology of Spirit. Hegel was obsessed with viewing the world through theory and speculation, and believed the highest type of science was knowledge, but not the rationalism of the recent High Enlightenment period. Ideas and theories were more real than the material world, and that was his knowledge. Essentially, knowledge was theory and speculation. The Latin root of the word speculation is speculum, which means to reflect, and the common image of speculation of the time was a man looking into a mirror that reflected the sky above him. Hegel's knowledge was derived from reflection on abstract things about the world, not on concrete things within it. Instead of gaining knowledge about the world through experimentation like Isaac Newton, who he hated, Hegel would have preferred to think of gravity and mass in abstract thought and, notably, to arrive at the truth through his own philosophical methods, not with the help of any outside phenomena. His main philosophical tool was called the dialectic. In 1820, he published the Encyclopedia of Philosophical Sciences in which he elaborated on this idea. A dialectic is a method of philosophical argument that involves contradictory processes between opposing sides, like in any modern debate. But Hegel was a philosophical successor of Rousseau, who had abandoned reason in his later years in favor of emotion. So Hegel wasn't satisfied with the traditional, rational dialectic that stretched all the way back to Plato. Plato's dialectical method used logic and reason to come to some sound conclusion, but Hegel believed Plato's logic couldn't reach past skepticism to full knowledge. He believed Plato's dialectic fell short of finding truth. It was only an approximation. Hegel's dialectic had three sides instead of two and wasn't part of classical logic. He said it was instead part of every concept and everything true in general. It has three moments. The first is initial understanding, or the positive moment, when a concept seems to have a stable definition. Then the second moment, the negative, is a moment of instability when determination shifts from the initial understanding to its opposite. This is what Hegel called Aufheben, and is a crucial concept. It is a German word that means both to cancel and to preserve. Hegel was obsessed with this idea, and using this idea of cancellation and preservation, the third moment is called the speculative moment, where the essences of the first two cancel out each other and are both preserved, leading to a higher knowledge of the concept. A modern example of the Hegelian dialectic put into practice would be this. Take the concept of freedom. The people of a country have a certain amount of self-evident freedom. This is the first moment. The country experiences a war and installs a dictator, destroying individual freedom. This is the second moment. The Aufheben of these two concepts of freedom would be a permanent state that allows freedom, the speculative moment. If combining a thing and its opposite and getting anything other than nothing doesn't make any sense to you, well, you're not alone. But then again, you're operating on logic, and Hegel didn't like logic. 
This Hegelian dialectical method is the engine upon which the entirety of the rest of this history runs, so it's crucial that you understand it. From here on out, the moments of the dialectic will be referred to as the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, respectively. Hegel was consumed with trying to find what was truly real. He believed that if the concept of being was a thesis and nothing was its antithesis, then the synthesis of these two concepts was becoming. When you see later scholars refer to transformation and unending progress for change, now you know where those ideas of becoming, or those beliefs, come from. Speaking of belief, Hegel also tried to understand the Christian belief in the Trinity through his dialectical framework. God was the ultimate truth, or what he called the absolute idea, completely transcendent. His opposite was nature, firmly rooted in the world and not transcendent at all. But since nature is unthinking and therefore incomplete, the synthesis of these two concepts, the absolute idea and the natural world, had to be in something higher than nature, and Hegel believed that to be embodied in the highest, most abstract form of humanity, the state. Here is the beginning of evil. Common sense would say that a thing and its opposite when combined would cancel each other out and remain that way, but Hegel wasn't partial to common sense, and so history unfolded in his abstract world. The Christian belief was that Jesus Christ is the true bridge between God and the world, but Hegel replaced him with the state. That means Hegel's philosophy and all ideologies built upon it, including Nazism, Marxism, and identity politics, are all Christian heresies. They are all born out of the idea of adding something to God or replacing him outright, since he is apparently not enough for us. Indeed, Marx himself allegedly said, my object in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. But here's where the ideas get really weird. Hegel believed that spirit, or Geist, comes from conditions created by the state. The object of spirit would meet its opposite, the subject of spirit, and synthesize to create a world spirit. Eventually, the dialectical process would progress enough that the world spirit would no longer be worldly, but would become the absolute idea. The state would become God. Here again, we have the idea of being and nothing synthesizing into becoming. In short, the absolute idea, God, creates the state, the state creates the culture, and the culture creates ideas, which progress in a dialectical process until the state becomes the absolute idea. God must create the mundane world in order to compare himself to it and realize that he is God, which is done through constantly synthesizing contradictions. Hegel believed the seeds of the divine were embedded in the culture, which would be worked out over time until the state became God. This is nothing short of alchemy. As the alchemists believed the seeds of gold needed to be awakened within lead, the Hegelians believed the absolute idea needed to be awakened within the culture. Interestingly, this has some overlap with New Age spirituality, which says that God lies within each of us and we just need to be awakened to our divine natures. But that's for another time in another video. Back to Hegel and his spirits. Perhaps this is all the story would have been if Hegel never died and he maintained control over his ideas forever. But he was human like all of us, and his death in 1831 caused a major rift in his acolytes. The Hegelians split into young and old. The old Hegelians were super conservative and believed Hegel's ultimate idea had already been realized in the state of Prussia at the time. The young Hegelians believed the ultimate idea had yet to be teased out of society, and one of them was a man named Karl Marx. Though a student of Hegel, Karl Marx rejected his obsession with speculation and ideas, and strived to bring the dialectical method into the material world. He favored activism and science, so he called himself a scientist of history. The concept of his science of history was laid out piece by piece across several works, maturing over time, but is summarized like this. Stage 1. History began as a primitive, tribal, communist society where everything was shared. Stage 2. Over time, some people took power over others, leading to dictatorships where the lower people were enslaved. Stage 3. This progressed into the feudal states of medieval times, made of many factions. Stage 4. Capitalism arose eventually, which gave immense power to the economic and political leaders of society. Stage 5. The oppressed lower classes would necessarily grow in contempt of capitalism, 
until they could no longer take the pressure and would revolt, overthrowing the capitalist leaders and installing an administrative socialist state which would stamp out oppression over time until everyone was equal. Notably, socialism would abolish private property since socialism is the public state ownership of property. Then the state would dissolve itself and, stage six, communism would arrive, where everyone was finally equal again. This was the logical conclusion since Marx was a secular humanist and didn't believe in the afterlife. Utopia could only occur on earth through revolution, and then good people would finally rule the world. In 1848, one of the most influential books in history was published. In order to ignite the revolution of the working classes that would eventually bring about a communist utopia, Marx published the Communist Manifesto. It's common knowledge that Marx championed the abolition of private property and that religion was the opiate of the masses, but he also believed heavily in applying the dialectic to capitalism. The capitalist pigs took all the money and power, and their opposite was the poor from whom they stole. This dialectical pair, or contradiction, could be exploited to bring about a synthesis and to move along the dialectical process. The proletariat revolution would only take place after a sufficient number of contradictions had all been synthesized, and like Hegel's absolute idea, the proletariat classes would eventually realize their true power. The manifesto took hold around the world and sparked many political movements, but on the timeline of American politics and in this history, the engine of Marxism, the dialectic, wouldn't be brought up again until 1903. In that year, after the Civil War and Reconstruction periods, a writer named W.E.B. Du Bois published The Souls of Black Folk, in which he reiterated the master-slave dialectic of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. This idea posits that a master is consumed by his own world and can't understand the world outside of his own, but a slave knows both his own world and the master's world in which he works. So the slave has what's called a dual consciousness. He alone is conscious of both perspectives. Dubois also postulated that a country is truly made up of a folk, meaning race, so racial groups should be treated like countries. So then the thought shifted from the Rousseauian master-slave relationships to racial master-slave dialectics. For a modern example, some people differentiate between being black and being American. A black American would have two consciousnesses, the American, which is a master, and the black, which is a slave. A white American could only have the perspective of the master, since white and American are part of the same terrible system, but more on that later. Around the time of Dubois, America wasn't alone in its socialist ruminations. George Lukács was the Hungarian Minister of Culture in 1919. He was part of a new formation of Marxism, later known as Cultural Marxism. As the Minister of Culture, he advocated for the liberation not of the proletariat working classes, but of sexual liberation as the driving force for revolution. This was the beginning of a new shift, which would explode in later decades with the writings of Antonio Gramsci, an Italian writer known as the godfather of cultural Marxism. While Marx had advocated for revolt along the political and economic lines, Gramsci realized that it wasn't working as well as it should. In fact, the lives of the working class people in capitalist America were going far better than their parents' or grandparents' generations. While imprisoned in Italy for many years, he wrote what would later be called the prison notebooks. Gramsci centered his philosophy on the idea of hegemonies. From Marx, a hegemony was a description of the dominion that one power has over another. This is the oppressive system Marx wanted liberation from. Hegemonies included political and economic means by which the prevailing power oppressed others. Gramsci argued that the hegemony was cultural as well, and that it needed to be infiltrated from the inside. This counter-hegemony would be done in five spheres. Family, religion, education, media, and law, with a special emphasis on education. This will be important later. Thus, Gramsci advocated for what's now called a long march through the institutions, which means the cultural Marxists would play the long game, slowly turning the capitalist institutions against themselves. As Jesus of Nazareth once said, a house divided against itself cannot stand, and so the dialectic progressed. As a side note, Gramsci is a key figure in this timeline, but his writings were in Italian and were translated into other European languages, though not yet English. The reason his writings were able to take hold in English-speaking countries was due to translation into English done by politician Pete Buttigieg's father, 
at Notre Dame from the 1980s through 2007. Joseph Buttigieg was the founder and president of the International Gramsci Society, an English professor emeritus at Notre Dame until his death in 2019. Though cultural Marxism shared much of its philosophy with Marx, two other branches of ideology were on the horizon that would reject Marx almost entirely. The first began when a certain Austrian painter became Chancellor of Germany in 1933. Adolf Hitler, as leader of the National Socialist Party of Germany, was aware of Hegel's dialectic and the progress Marxism aimed to make. He believed that the uprising of the oppressed classes would result in a race war. In order to get ahead of that, his goal was to make Germany into an empire of superior men and rule the world from the ashes of the race war. Marx championed class socialism, and Hitler championed race socialism. Though Nazis and communists hated each other throughout World War II, make no mistake, they come from the same root. Another school of philosophy was formed in the Weimar Republic during the interwar period and came to America after being politically ousted from Germany. The school was called the Frankfurt School, and the philosophy they brought was called Neo-Marxism. Like the Nazis, the Neo-Marxists had an interest in race, and like Marx, they rejected the philosophy that came before them, including traditional Marxism itself, which they called vulgar Marxism. The leader of the school in the 1930s was called Max Horkheimer, and his most influential student was Herbert Marcuse. In 1937, Horkheimer published Traditional and Critical Theory, which in the history of CRT may as well be their Bible, as it makes a critical distinction that forms the foundation of their activism. Traditional theories, Horkheimer said, emphasize epistemic adequacy. Epistemology is the branch of philosophy concerned with how one comes to know something, so traditional theories are just hypotheses. You aim to know something, so you test a theory to get to that knowledge. Critical theories, however, try to change the world instead of trying to understand it. Critical theories try to pick at the threads of society to awaken that critical consciousness. The critical consciousness, again, is the awareness of the slave of his own dual consciousness as described by W.E.B. Du Bois. Even with a fulfilled and happy life, the slave is unaware of his true servitude. These theories are transformative, and they have at least three components. One, acknowledge issues within the system. Two, identify people able to make changes to the system. And three, set norms and standards for those people to follow to change the system. So you see, instead of just trying to know the world as it is, critical theories like CRT try to change the world. They have an activism component baked in. That's why Marxist teachers will claim they don't teach CRT in schools. That's true, they do CRT in schools. In summary, critical theories seek liberation from slavery. Critical race theory seeks liberation from race slavery. Critical gender theory seeks liberation from gender slavery. Critical math seeks liberation from mathematical slavery, and so on. A critical theory is always a transformative one. This was the beginning of neo-Marxism, but it wouldn't reach its height until the 1960s. Meanwhile, in 1947, Horkheimer wrote a book called The Dialectic of Enlightenment with Theodore Adorno. Neo-Marxists considered themselves a rebirth of Marxism, or the true path to enlightenment. They believed vulgar Marxism had lost its way and forgotten the Hegelian roots. Marx had focused too much on economy in his later work Das Kapital, so the neo-Marxists turned back to theories and ideas as Hegel had. Like Hegel, they were anti-enlightenment, meaning the rational enlightenment of the 1700s. They believed mythology was higher truth than reason, and that the plague of reason the enlightenment had started would eventually come back around to mythology. In 1950, Adorno went on to write his own terrifying book called The Authoritarian Personality, a book which you may never have heard of, though you've certainly been affected by it. He argued that right-wing politics were by definition authoritarian, and that left-wing politics, whatever they did, could never be the same since critical theories sought liberation. People fighting for liberation could never be authoritarian. Ever wonder why people with immense power can still claim victimhood? This is the book that started that reasoning. They can never be authoritarians and are therefore always the ones being oppressed and never the ones doing the oppression. Sam Harris recently said that it didn't matter what Hunter Biden had done, even if he had murdered children, it wouldn't be as bad as Trump University. Left-wing good, right-wing bad. This is Adorno in essence, even if Harris doesn't realize it. The aforementioned Herbert Marcuse wrote a book a few years later in 1955 called Eros and Civilization. 
While the neo-Marxists aimed to put Hegel back into Marx, Marcuse was aiming to bring Sigmund Freud in as well, arguing that capitalism suppressed the libido of the working classes, and that the sexual liberation and communism were inextricably linked. Here, he was channeling the thoughts of George Lukács and his sexual liberation, and so the dialectic progressed. Later in 1964, Marcuse argued that capitalism flattened society down into one dimension, which of course needed liberation. His book, One Dimensional Man, was advocating for the same kind of class awakening Marx championed over a century prior, but now the lines of stratification in society were different than economic class. They involved disparity in sexual liberty, power, race, and gender. The act of awakening to that reality is again called realizing your critical consciousness. In the words of the master-slave dialectic, the slave is being awakened to his reality, which capitalism apparently suppresses. Since everything is viewed in the lens of the master-slave dialectic, everything is described in terms of power dynamics. This is another crucial point for you to understand. Without grasping this, everything after this point might as well be Greek. Everything in neo-Marxism and its successive ideologies is steeped in power dynamics. The next year, in 1965, Herbert Marcuse published one of his most influential books, called Repressive Tolerance. In the pages of that book, Marcuse wrote of his belief that tolerance in society at that time allowed for too much oppression. The right wing, previously characterized by Adorno as authoritarian, was allowed to oppress the left wing too much. Those prevailing people and ideas, the hegemony of Gramsci's prison notebooks, deserved intolerance in order to balance the unequal power dynamic Marcuse diagnosed society with having. In the reverse, the oppressed people and ideas should get more tolerance, regardless of what they do, as they are simply fighting back against the system that's keeping them down. If you're looking for the source of the double standard in politics, you found it. The neo-Marxists believed people like Adolf Hitler could have been prevented from doing evil by being repressed earlier in life. Then, their aim was to forecast the future lives of people, find the ones who would potentially do evil, and submit them to repressive tolerance. If you've heard boys being called future rapists, you've heard repressive tolerance. The logic of repressive tolerance is what we live in today. Shortly after Marcuse's writings, three other major thinkers entered the scope of history in critical theory. In 1966, Michel Foucault wrote The Order of Things. In 1967, Jacques Derrida wrote Speech and Phenomena. And in 1968, H. George Fredrickson formulated his theory of social equity in public administration. Foucault created the postmodern knowledge principle. He believed knowledge was socially constructed in the service of power, created to benefit only the elite, whether intentionally or unintentionally. He called this thing power knowledge, but it's been immortalized by the phrase knowledge is power more recently, or rather, the ancient phrase has been co-opted. Also, he took the power dynamics of Marcuse one step further, writing that the relationship between power levels is more important than the knowledge of truth or falsity. This is similar to Nietzsche. If God is dead, and therefore the source of truth is no more, all that remains is power. Derrida's contribution to the movement was in deconstructionism. He believed that words and language couldn't convey true meaning, since any word just referred to one or more other words. Therefore, the search for meaning never ends. It's infinitely deferred. Why this is important is because Derrida argued that there can be no objective interpretation of any writing. The words on the page just refer to other words in our heads, which refer to yet other words, and so on. This is the essence of postmodernism, which claims no ultimate reason. Derrida also believed words came in male-female pairs, and to understand one word or phrase, you must use the paired word or phrase. Since history has largely been the telling of conquests of males, therefore the future is female. This was a big shift, since Derrida modified the dialectic of Hegel. Instead of merging a thesis with its antithesis to get something greater, Derrida picked apart the first two concepts and left the pieces on the floor. This is one reason why many Christians decide to leave Christianity after deconstructing their faith. They don't build faith back up again after taking it apart. Once faith is taken apart, if there's no reconstruction, why would you remain a Christian who relies on evidential faith? Under Derrida, there is no objective interpretation of the Bible, and faith gets picked apart and left on the floor. If this happens, we can make Jesus say whatever we want. H. George Fredrickson who worked in public administration, coined the term social equity theory in 1968. At the time, public administration stood on two pillars, efficiency and economy. Fredrickson offered social equity, today just known as equity, as a third pillar to be added. This forced equity 
which is the neo-Marxist word for socialist state administration, into American public administration and turned the movement into a bureaucratic disease. Reaching the height of neo-Marxism in 1969, Horkheimer and Marcuse would make more large waves. Horkheimer gave a small speech on his critical theory of decades prior, reiterating the things he had said before, and Marcuse published his greatest book, An Essay on Liberation. If you remember that critical theories seek liberation, you'll see Horkheimer's influence on his prodigy. But first, a jump back in time. Just after the turn of the century, Teddy Roosevelt was president, and the United States was gripped by multiple powerful monopolies. If Marx had been right about capitalism leading into socialism, that would have been the moment the revolution would have happened. But, due to Roosevelt and Taft after him, that future never came. Instead of a proletariat uprising, the trusts were broken up and the lives of the lower class workers were greatly improved. Marcuse and Horkheimer recognized that Marx had been wrong. Unlike the cultural Marxists who agreed with Marx in principle but added to his philosophy, the neo-Marxists rejected him outright. In other words, they conceded that the American dream was real. But they still wanted their revolution, because even though the lower class Americans were satisfied with their lives, the neo-Marxists thought they were just deluded, that they just hadn't been awakened to their critical consciousness. So in order to do that, the dialectic progressed. Marxian class revolt was dead. Joseph Stalin's communist Russia had been a disastrous, deadly joke of an experiment, and old Marxism was now vulgar. Marcuse said we needed a new sensibility, or a new way of looking at the world. In other words, he was saying that real communism had never been tried. He believed that while the proletariat in Russia had revolted and taken over, because of their outdated sensibility, they became oppressors themselves and collapsed. This new sensibility would have to be identity-driven, and the target of his changing efforts would be the ghetto populations. The previous decades of brainstorming new avenues of liberation coalesced into this new sensibility, which is still going strong today, and the dialectic progressed. Three new things emerged at this time. Neo-Marxism fully emerged out of vulgar Marxism, and the Frankfurt School entered a new generation of leaders, but both of these would be eclipsed by the most influential movement, black feminism. Black liberation predated black feminism, and even got some traction in the 1940s and 50s, especially during wartime. Black soldiers were shown to be just as capable as white ones, but as everyone knows, it really caught wind in the 1960s with the likes of Martin Luther King Jr. at the helm. He became a celebrity around the world, and the cry for racial justice in America had never been stronger. At the same time, the second wave of feminism, led by Betty Friedan, was making waves in America like it had before in the 19th and early 20th centuries. However, the black female activists in feminism thought the civil rights movement was too focused on black men, and that the feminist movement itself was too focused on white women. So they decided to make their own movement, which was the most radical of them all. Of course, being influenced by the likes of Herbert Marcuse, they focused on things like racial capitalism, the idea that capitalism appropriates the labor of racial minorities, and the oppression of blacks during America's slavery years. The scholars that centered their studies on race and racial power conflicts would continue to fan the flame of revolution for decades to come. But in the course of this historical telling, they won't make a resurgence until 1986. In the late 1960s, after the civil rights movement, People like Weatherman Bill Ayers and Herbert Marcuse's PhD student Angela Davis traded the peaceful protests of Martin Luther King Jr. for violent riots and domestic terrorism to force their identity politics on the American public. This didn't win over many sympathizers, so they shifted their gaze to education, just like Antonio Gramsci, and almost all of them eventually went to teach K-12. Neo-Marxism had divorced from vulgar Marxism and adopted identity as its new sensibility. And so, in conjunction with the black liberation and black feminism movements, the new identity Marxism movement took shape. 1971 came, and the long march through the institutions finally paid off for cultural Marxism in the legal sphere, since many civil rights cases were being adjudicated upon. The first landmark case in identity politics, Griggs versus Duke Power, set a scary precedent. Duke Power had been giving intelligence tests to people in the lowest tier of employment to determine if they could advance in their careers. And they did so knowing that black Americans couldn't read as well as whites, since schools hadn't caught up yet after desegregation. Duke Power was rightfully sued, and the practice was deemed discrimination. But the ruling opened the door wide for all kinds of things to slip through. 
They ruled that disparate impact, meaning different outcomes, inequity, could be used as proof of discrimination, even without intent. This may have worked for Duke's case, but it aligned perfectly with identity and Marxism's focus on power dynamics, since any difference in power could be ruled as discrimination in the future. The next year, a woman named Pat Bidal published Developing New Perspectives on Race, which changed the landscape entirely, again. Less than a decade prior, MLK's 1963 I Have a Dream speech advocated for judging everyone on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. In 1972, Baidal refined racism as prejudice plus power, and so MLK's dream died on the doorstep of identity politics. No longer would racism be confined to prejudice based on skin color. It could now be broadened to mean whatever one wanted, because everything is a power dynamic, so everything can be racist. Yes, this idea is not new, it's been around for a long time. Baidal also coined a few phrases you may have heard in the last few years. You were either part of the problem or part of the solution. People are either racists or anti-racists. There is no neutral. Ibram X. Kendi has Baidal to thank for that one. In 1973, Baidal produced a manual in conjunction with the NEA, the teachers' union, which was then disseminated through the public school system. Don't be surprised if the teachers' union today supports critical race theory. They have for a long time. It's not about teaching your kids to learn to read and write. It's about power. Next up in 1974 was the forming of the Combahee River Collective, named after the 1863 raid of Combahee River, which was conducted by Harriet Tubman, and which emancipated 700 slaves. Unlike Tubman, the organization was styled as a black feminist lesbian socialist collective, and it put out the Combahee River Collective statement in 1977. This was the height of black liberation and black feminism that had emerged out of neo-Marxism and the civil rights movement. This statement is credited with introducing the concept of interlocking systems of oppression within society, which is a key part of intersectionality. Another event happened in 1977 that isn't core to DEI but is still interesting. Angela Davis made a statement to her friend, cult leader Jim Jones. Contrary to popular belief, Jim Jones wasn't a crazy Christian, but a neo-Marxist. Angela compared the two movements and called them one and the same. I attempted to say, though not very eloquently, that we are with you, and we appreciate everything you have done, and we know you are going to win, and in the final analysis, we are all going to win. Back to Combahee River, the goal of introducing intersectionality was for one reason, to bring other movements of oppressed minorities under one banner to carry water for the black feminist movement, and it worked like a charm. In 1978, another landmark court case was ruled upon. Regents of the University of California v. Backey was a case of racial discrimination in the University of California. Affirmative action was ruled as being legal because it can sometimes be justified by a need for diversity. However, they ruled that having only a few minority students in a university wouldn't be enough to give them a comfortable experience, and the minority voice wouldn't be adequately represented since they would be some kind of token students. So a significant number of minority students would be required to alleviate the problem. Even though quotas were acknowledged as being illegal, race quotas got in through the back door that this case opened up. This adequate number of minority students was called a critical mass. Justice Lewis Powell laid out a set of principles to be used in university admissions. 1. Quotas are illegal and cannot be used. 2. Everyone should be reviewed under the same admissions track. 3. Race should be included as a plus factor in addition to things like life experience, talents, or geography. 4. Applicants should be treated as individuals, not stand-ins for any particular group. 5. No favoritism should be given to any race. But you can see, especially through Principle 3, how this system of principles can be exploited. And it was. The same year, the next big milestone came. Judith Katz wrote the book White Awareness and through it became the pioneer of white re-education. She believed the system of whiteness that was ingrained in America was racist and in her own words, the program strives to help whites understand that racism in the United States is a white problem and that being white implies being racist. Read that sentence again. Being white implies being racist. Therefore, white people can't win. Racism is the combination of prejudice plus power, and whites are the default or master race in America, 
So no matter what happens, thanks to Adorno's authoritarian personality, whiteness is discrimination. Whiteness is racism. It was plain to see even in 1978. 1979 had yet more milestones on the critical race theory history track. John Francois Lyotard wrote The Postmodern Condition, in which he coined the term legitimation by pyrology. Fancy words aside, this is the concept of consensus making things true. If enough people agree on something, then that thing becomes true. You can see how, like Lyotard said, this is very dangerous. He was actually warning against it in his book. Nowadays, this concept is combined with repressive tolerance. The right wing is suppressed, and the left wing is supported. Then, enough popular leftist voices agree on something, and that thing becomes true. Unfortunately, some members of the media... Some members of the media... Some members of the media... Some, some members of the media, media use their, their platforms to push their own personal bias. bias. To push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This gives people immense power and is akin to the idea of might makes right. Another important court case came that year too. United Steelworkers vs. Weber took a big step down the road that Griggs vs. Duke Power and Regents vs. Backey had created. Women and minorities were given the ability to be favored in sex or race conscious hirings as a form of fulfilling the backdoor quotas. Remember, the running idea was that the system was inherently off balance, with the elite controlling the oppressed. And so, to write that imbalance, this ruling was handed down. Also, the statute of limitations on historical oppressions was lifted. Essentially, the Supreme Court agreed that historical oppression, like American slavery or women's rights suppression, was enough to allow someone special hiring privileges in return. If a limitation was given, the justice for that oppression may never come to pass. So historical oppression was allowed to refer to any historical oppression ever, and the oppressed status would never be lifted. That's why reparations will never work today, because the same people can just keep claiming victimhood with legal precedent. The 1980s marked a big cultural change in many aspects of America, and it's a decade generally well loved, especially by people who were kids at that time. But make no mistake, plenty of terrible things happened in the 80s as well, and of course, the dialectic progressed. Apparently sometime in that decade, a man named Louis Griggs, not the Griggs from the earlier court case, coined the phrase diversity and inclusion. He was concerned with being too ethnocentric and wanted America to focus on multiculturalism. A black friend of his apparently told him that America wasn't ready for that, even though this was nearly 20 years after desegregation. If you take the leftist track of history though, America has always been and always will be systemically racist, and no amount of sacrifice by MLK or Malcolm X could have fixed that. 1981 was a sort of eclectic year for neo-Marxist history, meaning that a variety of ideas were pulled into the mass of leftism from a variety of sources. First, Henry Giroux wrote Ideology, Culture, and the Process of Schooling. His ideas were built on the work of Paulo Freire, a Brazilian educator. Freire had written Pedagogy of the Oppressed in 1968, which was translated into English in 1970. Pedagogy is best understood as the approach to teaching, so you can see how critical theory entered into education, just like Antonio Gramsci had prescribed. Freire's book included a detailed Marxist class analysis and is the third most cited book in social sciences. Henry Giroux treated Freire like some kind of godly figure. While he wasn't as direct as Freire, who cited Lenin and praised Mao, Henry Giroux cited Horkheimer, Marcuse, and Adorno in his work. Between these two works, the traditional pedagogy was replaced by critical pedagogy, and the counter-hegemony brought education into its fold. The cultural Marxist revolution takes place in steps. Nowadays, some may say that Marxist teaching wants to replace the family with the state, but that isn't exactly accurate. The institution is the middle step between those two, which is why parents are being told they need to listen to the schools, and why teachers are emboldened to dictate the lives of their students. The schools will eventually give way to other institutions, and lastly to the state, which will control all as in George Orwell's 1984. At the same time all of this was going on, Jean Baudrillard wrote Simulacra and Simulation, which is basically The Matrix. If you've seen The Matrix, you've seen Simulacra and Simulation. Literally, the book is featured in the beginning of the movie before Neo meets Morpheus. Baudrillard's book was mostly a warning, not advocacy for simulation theory. He believed there was a sort of hyper-reality, something more real than real. 
this hyperreality is formed socially and linguistically through social interaction and language, but we choose to live in this hyperreality instead of the real world. Imagine someone who chooses to live as some sort of internet avatar instead of the real selves, just like Ready Player One, or Second Life, or The Matrix. Baudrillard also said that there was a major focus on race within this framework, meaning that people would choose to live as their race instead of their being. A black American doesn't live as a human who lives in America and is black, but as a black American human. Let's put a few of these milestone books together. Because of Freire and Giraud, the public education system could then teach its students to deconstruct their realities with Derrida, focus on power struggles with Hegel, Marx, and Marcuse, criticize everything with Horkheimer, study race with Baidol and Katz, and choose to live in this hyper-reality that Baudrillard had described. And all of this was true using Leotard's legitimation by paralogy, meaning that consensus made right, and was allowed by several powerful court cases over the prior few decades. Lastly, in 1981, some of H. George Fredrickson's social equity work had paid off with the introduction of the Professional Standards and Ethics Guide for Public Administrators published by the ASPA. The essential takeaways from this policy were the following. Social equity had been made the third pillar of public administration and was to be implemented by two standards. First, to recognize that citizen A is equal to citizen B. Great, sounds good. And second, when citizen A and citizen B are unequal, citizen A is to be made to be equal with citizen B. This contradiction makes no sense for the people who realize equality and equity are polar opposites, but it's perfectly fine for the people who want to accelerate the contradictions, like Lenin said, or in more relevant terms, progress the dialectic. Any policy on DEI in public administration, or private for that matter, will start by acknowledging that people are equal. This is Fredrickson in plain sight. Then they will go on to advocate the recognition and acceptance of fundamental differences, and for change when those create inequity. This is also Fredrickson. Now you know the basics, comrade. A few years later, Bell Hooks published Feminist Theory from Margin to Center in 1984. There was a fascination of hers with margins and centers, of course, since everything is a power dynamic. The powerful are in the center, and anyone not a part of that group gets marginalized. You will see that the journey from Hegel to Hooks over a length of 177 years is a straight line. She writes that ideas and theories, just like Hegel said, are essential, this time for effective feminist movement. This movement will mobilize people to change society, straight from Horkheimer as well. Revolutionaries seek to make society better, and thus need the revolutionary philosophy of dialectics. They also need a body of ideas, an ideology, based on finding and changing the contradictions in society in order to reach a higher reality. Boom. Critical theory. I mentioned the year 1986 in part 3. Here, that foreshadowing comes to fruition. Critical race theory, though not yet called by that name, would be birthed out of the critical legal studies movement in 1986. The object of the critical legal studies movement since the late 70s had been to use critical theories and point out and undermine dialectical contradictions found within the US legal system. This was on mission directly from Antonio Gramsci, and many of the people involved had worked tireless careers to achieve their goals. However, the whole movement was about to explode. The advocates of CLS believed the civil rights movement had been exhausted, and so of course their approach was far more radical. Unfortunately for them, the majority of them were white and male. The race-conscious scholars therefore saw critical legal studies, regardless of the leftist achievements it had accomplished, as just another white institution that needed abolition. In 1986, the National Critical Legal Studies Conference was held at Pine Manor College in Massachusetts. The white leftists invited race scholars to lead discussions in a workshop centered around race relations. What they didn't know was that the scholars had designed their workshop to call out and undermine the white leftist CLS workers themselves. Of course, when the critical eye was turned back on the leftists, pandemonium ensued, and they suddenly became defensive when they were asked, what is it about the whiteness of CLS that discourages participation by people of color? In one fell swoop, the movement was dead. And from the ashes arose the critical race theory movement, which is still alive and kicking today. After another gap of years, in 1989, a few scholars met to discuss the burgeoning race-conscious movement taking place. 
Among them were Kimberly Crenshaw, Richard Delgado, Mary Matsuda, Derek Bell, and Linda Green. This meeting was the 1989 Critical Race Theory Workshop and was held at the University of Wisconsin Law School and the Holy Wisdom Monastery. From their own writings, they admit that CRT as an organized movement began there. The fundamentals of CRT are discussed in different parts of this video, so I won't elaborate on them here. This piece of the timeline is important for bringing many of the central activists together and being the time when the actual term CRT was coined. Also in 1989, Judith Katz made a resurgence with another book called The Challenge of Diversity. This center of society that Bell Hooks described was to be laid out in detail by Katz. White European culture became the foundation of US institutions and cultural norms, which always made people of color feel uncomfortable and excluded. She said this was because white culture was the only legitimate one. Of course, common sense says otherwise, but Katz was functioning on legitimation by pyrology. She detailed a large list of aspects of white culture, which amounted to nothing more than stereotypes, really. These aspects of white culture were fundamental to America and needed to be abolished. They are quite ridiculous, but I'll cover them in detail later when the Smithsonian uses them in 2019. They came directly from the proto-critical race theory movement a few years prior to Katz. But before we get there, more dialectical progression is needed. Nineteen ninety. The 80s were gone and a new era emerged. All the prior successes and failures had built up to this moment. This year was the beginning of wokeness in the form we know today. It began with Patricia Hill Collins, who published Black Feminist Thought, which is still widely used in feminist and women's studies around the country. She invoked the dialectic repeatedly throughout the work. Keep in mind that before this time, the link between neo-Marxism and black feminism was Angela Davis. Of course, Herbert Marcuse before her encouraged critical thinking in black liberation movements since he saw them as the ghetto populations he wanted to radicalize. But Angela Davis was his activist protege. She planted the seeds of the tree from which Patricia Hill Collins was picking fruit. By her words, black feminist thought simply existed as resistance to the systems of oppression that affected U.S. black women. And without those systems of oppression, black feminism wouldn't exist. The two exist in a dialectical relationship. Black feminist thought supported any measure of activism or policy that sought to fix the problems generated by any number of intersecting identities black women existed within. Unsurprisingly, Patricia Hill Collins later published a related book called Intersectionality. A man named Mike Oliver published The Politics of Disablement in the same year as Black Feminist Thought and increased the length of the intersectional roll call with the addition of the disabled. A few years earlier, he had coined the term social model of disability, and in the 1990 book, he stressed the responsibility of society to make up for the lack of ability disabled people had. This kind of equity is something nobody minds today. If someone can't walk, they get elevator access or a handicap spot. If someone is blind, they get braille signs or raised dots on the sidewalk. This kind of equity raises the people up who can't do certain things for themselves and gives them the same outcomes as others. But no one thinks this is crazy because, like I said, they can't do these things for themselves. A blind person can't just start seeing. But as Presidents Theodore Roosevelt and Howard Taft showed, with the proper rules set in place and exploitation minimized, under a capitalist system, the lowest of workers can have a good life. But Marxist ideology assumed then, and assumes now, that the system makes people different and that they can't overcome those differences, ever. How depressing. At this time, H. George Fredrickson was again part of an eclectic mix of ideas brought into the fold of woke ideology. He published Public Administration and Social Equity in 1990 and continued to push for social equity in public administration. He argued that public administration, while at the time neutral and focused on economy and efficiency, should in fact be involved in politics and policy making. To say that a service may be well managed and that a service may be efficient and economical still begs these questions. Well managed for whom? Efficient for whom? Economical for whom? Clearly, he stressed the appearance of power dynamics even in public administration and considered public administration another aspect of American culture that needed to be disrupted, dismantled, and rebuilt. 
The next year, one of the most famous critical theorists of the 21st century entered the literary scene. Kimberly Crenshaw wrote the book Mapping the Margins in 1991, where she aimed to delineate between the center, powerful, and margins, oppressed, in society. Here, another key concept is fleshed out. Structural material determinism is the idea that the structure and material of one's immediate culture are what make the person the way they are. There is no balance between nature and nurture, it's all nurture. This is what made every white person complicit in racial oppression of blacks. The fact that they grew up in the white, European, Christian West made them implicitly racist. Think again of MLK's I Have a Dream speech. We should all be judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin, right? Crenshaw posited that material and structure, cultural aspects including skin color, determine the character of a person so MLK's dream could never have been realized. Now you see why pointing an identity Marxist to the civil rights movement doesn't do anything. They believe it didn't go far enough. Just look at Angela Davis. Many people previously, in response to the slogan Black Lives Matter, asked, but shouldn't we really be saying all lives matter? They're now finally getting it. That as long as black people continue to be treated in this way, as long as the violence of racism remains what it is, then no one is safe. Kimberly Crenshaw also recognized the power of Jacques Derrida's deconstruction, but made it clear that the racial categories of identity politics shouldn't themselves be deconstructed. Deconstructionism just leaves the pieces on the floor, and the racial categories were needed to fuel the revolution. Without that fuel, the fire of Marxism would dwindle and be snuffed out. She believed that the act of putting people into categories was some form of oppression done by the people in power which is in line with the modern thinking that you can't call a child molester a pedophile. It's hurtful and racist. Some identities, however, allowed those categorized and marginalized people to resist the system. It gave them righteous hatred for the system and a love for rebellion. Like people before her and many since, Crenshaw made the distinction between definitions of race. The phrase, I am black, meant something different from, I am a person who happens to be black. The latter is just a marker of someone's skin color, a recognition of how they look. The former is a sign of allegiance with the revolution. There was then a difference between being racially black and politically black. What do you think of when you think of the word race? Merriam-Webster says race is any one of the groups that humans are often divided into based on physical traits regarded as common among people of shared ancestry. But here's a quote from critical race theorists that generally shocks first-time listeners. Race is defined as a misleading and deceptively appealing classification of human beings created by white people originally from Europe, which assigns human worth and social status using the white racial identity as the archetype of humanity for the purpose of creating and maintaining privilege, power, and systems of oppression. When politician Larry Elder ran for governor in California, he was called the black face of white supremacy. And when Kanye West came out in support of Donald Trump, he was told by Ta-Nehisi Coates that he was no longer black. These are examples of separating out the comrades from the dissidents. They don't want liberation from American slavery. That already happened. They want liberation from a boogeyman of their own making. Lastly, Crenshaw wrote that critical race theory is the fusion of neo-Marxism and postmodernism. The neo-Marxists believe in a socialist revolution through identity disparity, and postmodernists believe in the rejection of reason and objectivity. Combine those, and what emerges is critical race theory in essence. She wrote about anti-essentialism, which is the counter to essentialism. Essentialism is the idea that objects have a set of characteristics or attributes necessary to their identities. For example, a circle must be round, and a square must have four corners. Anti-essentialism is the counter to that, as the idea that nothing has necessary attributes. Therefore, there is no concrete definition for circles or squares, or even blacks or women, and you can see how that fits into modern thought. Crenshaw believed that anti-essentialism couldn't be applied to racial categories, otherwise there would be no reason to organize around them. Now you can see the application of double standards in plain sight. The vulgar Marxists were still constrained by reality and truth, since they were modernist. They had rules to work within, a counter-hegemony to build slowly through the institutions. The new Marxists were so effective because postmodern thought allowed for total rejection of knowledge, truth, and even reality. They could do whatever they wanted as long as it forged the revolution. A few more writings round out the 1990s, the decade of the birth of wokeness. 1995 saw Gloria Ladson Billings write toward a critical race theory of education. 
She lamented the progress that had been made so far in critical theories, saying, Previous intellectuals Woodson and Dubois presented cogent arguments for considering race as the central construct for understanding inequality. In many ways, our work is an attempt to build on the foundation laid by these scholars. She believed the point of CRT was to do just that. The liberationist movement sought freedom from consumer capitalism and other systems of oppression, and from that, black liberation sought freedom from racial oppression of any kind. The focus had shifted and needed to be brought back to black liberation. If it isn't clear yet, let it be known that the other identities found in the web of intersectionality are just useful idiots for the race-conscious CRT pushers. If you are one of those people, you are just being made to carry water for the racial revolutionaries. This kind of thing happened in communist Russia and China as well. At some point you'll either be too much of a threat to them, or not uphold the revolution well enough. And when you're no longer useful, you'll be purged too. Remember that the applause at Joseph Stalin's speeches would go on forever because the first person to stop clapping would be disappeared. History never repeats itself, but it does rhyme. A side note on the practice of purging. This practice is called entryism. In its entirety, entryism includes both the purging of dissidents and the replacement of them with morally aligned conformist comrades. Defund the police is not a movement to bring justice to those harmed by police brutality. It's a movement to replace cops that will keep law and order with cops who will bend the knee to Marxism when the revolution begins. During the pandemic, many people lost their jobs due to restrictions on vaccinations and mask mandates. These too were entryism tactics since those people could be replaced with useful idiots. Learn to spot this tactic being used and call it out. 1996 saw Kimberly Crenshaw publish Critical Race Theory, the key writings that formed the movement. If the link between critical race theory and neo-Marxism hadn't been clear enough, this summary book removed all doubt. The CRT movement was organized by a collection of neo-Marxist intellectuals, former New Left activists, ex-counterculturalists, and other oppositionists. She explained that it infiltrated law schools to expose and challenge the ways American laws apparently legitimized the oppressive social order. But really, it was CLS at that point and morphed into CRT after 1986. Critical race theory is explained as being emancipation from race slavery in all its forms. Remember that definition of race from earlier. The definition of CRT cannot get more literal than that. The idea of race slavery having all kinds of forms, combined with the released statute of limitations on historical oppression afforded to them by the courts, gave and still gives critical race theorists some of the most powerful political tools ever wielded in American politics. 1997 was the year when Charles Mills wrote The Racial Contract. You can see how the hyperfixation on race continued even as Y2K approached. Jean-Jacques Rousseau's philosophy made a resurgence here, mainly his idea of the social contract. The social contract is the sum of all policies in society that all members of said society subscribe to in order to be a member of that society. They are fundamentally agreed upon. The racial contract asserted that there was a racial component to social contracts that every white person consciously or subconsciously agreed upon, just like Paulo Ferreri asserted with his hidden curriculum in schools that excluded non-white students. Note that I said asserted. Luckily for Mills and Freire, the basics of postmodernism allow for them to make baseless assertions and have them taken as gospel. In 2001, one of the most influential books in recent history was published. Richard Delgado and Jean Stefanczyk published Critical Race Theory, an introduction. They clarified that CRT was unlike traditional civil rights, as the movement that had apparently been exhausted by the late 70s. Traditional civil rights aimed for slow, incremental progress in the lives of black people. CRT, on the other hand, asserted that incremental changes could not meaningfully take place because they're always being fought back down by the system of oppression instituted by all white people. Therefore, as Delgado and Stefanczyk believed, the whole system needed to be disrupted and dismantled, and a new one set up to replace it, to do things right this time. Go figure. And so, the CRT fervor was notched up again. In 2003, the critical mass argument from Regents vs. Backey was brought back into the mainstream by Angelo and Chetta in Revisiting Backey. This was done in preparation for the upcoming decision on the case of Grutter vs. Bollinger. He fixated on the critical mass argument from the original case, advocating for more preferential admissions to college for racial and sexual minorities. 
Anchetta derived his understanding of race from Michael Omi and Howard Winnant, who are plainly Gramscian in their philosophies. They developed the racial formation theory as an analytical tool to look at race as a socially constructed identity. By their teachings, the content and importance of racial categories are determined by social, economic, and political means, meaning they, and Anchetta after them, directly support structural material determinism. In his book, Anchetta laid out the details of the original court case and then dove into identity Marxism advocation. As many people before him, Anchetta argued that colleges and universities needed a substantial amount of minorities to be truly diverse, otherwise the few applicants of minority status would be tokenized. And that idea played out in Grutter vs. Bollinger. The decision in this case affirmed and amplified the decision in Bakke. The critical mass theory was completely vindicated, the activists were emboldened, and the multi-billion dollar DEI industry we have now was built on the back of these two decisions. Skipping forward to 2007, B. E. Vaughn published The History of Diversity Training and Its Pioneers, a historical summary similar to CRT, the writings that formed the movement. He wrote this article for Strategic Diversity and Inclusion Management magazine, and later republished in Diversity Officer magazine, if that tells you the purpose of the writing. He affirmed the claim that diversity education was a reaction to the civil rights movement, and that the main point of race education was to highlight the differences between races, totally in opposition to meritocratic traditions. He mentions diversity hot seat trainings. This is where a group of people, be it a class, office, or other organization, are split into two groups based on power dynamics, typically separated by race. Through the training, all the white people confess various microaggressions, thoughts of hatred, or forms of varied oppression against the black or brown people sitting directly across from them. These were originally done all the way back in the 1940s and early 50s by the US military, but were abandoned for causing too much strife. And yet, without reform, these trainings were imported directly into critical pedagogy, critical legal studies, and race-conscious training sessions in many companies. Importantly, Vaughn notes that the white participants acted in three ways when confronted like this. One group of whites became more insightful about the barriers to race relations as a result of being put on the hot seat during the encounters. Another group became more resistant to racial harmony as they fought against accepting the facilitator's label of them as racists. A third group became what the military referred to as fanatics. These individuals began advocating against any forms of racial injustice after the training. So a portion of them became insightful and changed their worldviews in some way. A portion became resistant and defensive after the attacks, and most importantly, a portion became fanatical. These people became obsessed with seeking out and destroying any form of race oppression and believed that any resources not put toward that goal were wasted. Of course, this allowed the powerful diversity officers and trainers to demean and harass the merely introspective people, purge and fire the defensive and resistant ones, and give immense power to the fanatics. If history has taught us anything, it's that fanaticism shouldn't be given power. But if people knew their history, they wouldn't be communists. I will briefly mention Daryl Wing Sue in his article titled Microaggressions, More Than Just Race, in 2010. He didn't coin the term microaggression, but he did indicate that they are the everyday slights, snubs, or insults, whether intentional or unintentional, which communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to target persons based solely upon their marginalized group membership. Chester Pierce actually coined the term way back in 1970 in Offensive Mechanisms, the Vehicle for Microaggression. Pierce saw that not much real racism was happening after MLK, so he searched for it in tiny doses. He wrote, One must not look for the gross and obvious. The subtle, cumulative mini-assault is the substance of today's racism. Microaggressions are small, but build up over time to something dangerous and deadly. They may seem like a joke, but Daryl Wing Sue served as an advisor to President Bill Clinton in 1996. This stuff goes up to the highest levels. This point is where things take a vicious and evil turn. When I say evil, I don't mean some nebulous definition. Critical race theory post-2010 devours people. It takes advantage of the average person's common decency and desire to do good and warps it into advocacy for whatever they want. Let me make it very clear that I do not advocate for harm to come to the people who push for CRT and its related ideologies. 
Of course, I do want justice for them whenever they step out of line, but the traditional correct definition of justice. Not the warped, corrupted, neo-Marxist idea of justice. You will see shortly why I claim that these ideas are evil. It's the evil ideas that must be abolished, not the people. In 2010, while microaggressions were being toyed with by Daryl Dwing Su, Barbara Applebaum was foisting her writings upon the world with a hideous book titled Being White, Being Good, White Complicity, White Moral Responsibility, and Social Justice Pedagogy. You can kind of get an idea of the whole book just from the title. All white people are infected with racism. Racism meaning power and prejudice, by the way. The relevant point for now is that all white people are racist or complicit by virtue of benefiting from privileges that are not something they can voluntarily renounce. Applebaum cited Charles Mill's racial contract argument, claiming that all white people conspire against all non-whites all the time. They aim to keep a permanent grasp of power and create a permanent subclass of non-whites apparently. White privilege protects and supports white moral standing. All whites are responsible for white dominance since their very being depends on it. One thing used to perpetuate the system is white ignorance. To achieve the racial contract, there is a need to perpetuate ignorance and to misinterpret the world as it really is. Whites aim to stay rooted in the master-slave dialectic from all those years back, apparently. In her words, the racial contract is an officially sanctioned reality that is divergent from actual reality. One has an agreement to misinterpret the world. But her idea of reality truly stems from the mind of Hegel, who didn't believe material reality was all that important, so she exists in a contradiction. But that's not a problem for postmodernism. Next comes the white savior of all repressed minorities, Robin D'Angelo, in 2011. Her gigantically popular book, White Fragility, garnered global attention and made her millions of dollars. Many years prior, Judith Katz had wanted multiculturalism to be more widespread, and wanted all races and their cultures to be perfectly balanced. Her concessions to the white race are gone in D'Angelo's work. In fact, she says, A positive white identity is an impossible goal. White identity is inherently racist. White people do not exist outside the system of white supremacy. Again, she emphasizes that discrimination takes place unconsciously, but as Chester Pierce before her was searching high and low for racism, she says that most discrimination happens that way. More than this, even saying, we don't discriminate, I'm racially colorblind, or I treat everyone equally, just serve to stand in the way of real racial justice. This is what they call white talk. These attitudes turn a blind eye to the true reality and allow unconscious discrimination to continue unabated. She also makes a distinction between diversity as it was commonly known and critical diversity. In practice, diversity is not a variety of perspectives formed by various experiences being brought together. No, diversity really refers to people who, though they have different backgrounds, all have the correct politics. Diversity of race means diversity of people who understand their place in the system of prejudice and oppression. This awakened state is, again, called critical consciousness. Next, in 2012, D'Angelo published her worst book called Is Everyone Really Equal? In it, she changes the idea of minority from a noun into a verb. People can be minoritized or oppressed by the power system domination of white hegemony. Furthermore, a collection of people of the same race is never benign. There is always some form of exclusion going on. Common sense would tell us that because we do not believe in discrimination, we do not engage in it. However, most discrimination is unconscious and takes place whether we intend to discriminate or not. D'Angelo advocated for seeing people not as individuals, but as members of key racial groups, since seeing people as racial groups allowed for seeing the patterns of structural injustice allegedly existent. To point out the relevance of our group memberships is to challenge a privilege to which we often feel entitled. The privilege to see ourselves and be seen by others as individuals outside of social groups. On the white side of things, if a white person gets defensive, as people often do when confronted, this isn't to be taken as a profession of innocence, but of guilt. This is known as the Kafka trap. Any claim of innocence must be used as proof of guilt. Their defensiveness sends an unwelcoming message to anyone else in the room who may want to engage constructively. Defensiveness in this context is an indication of a dominant worldview, and it functions to protect that worldview rather than expand it, lower any defensiveness you may be feeling. Importantly, she admits that many critical social justice movements started out peacefully, but turned to reject individualism, peace, and even freedom. 
They don't want free speech. They want a boot on your face forever. Many of these movements initially advocated for a type of liberal humanism, individualism, freedom, and peace, but quickly turned to a rejection of liberal humanism. A couple more terms are relevant here. There is a racial scale of oppression. Whiteness is on top, and blackness is on bottom, permanently. Racism moves down the scale toward blacks, so black people can never be racist, and whites always are. Anyone being racist is participating in anti-blackness. Also, anyone of another race who sides at all with whiteness is accused of white adjacency, or the act of being too white. Much of this is affirmed in the 2013 Handbook of Critical Race Theory in Education, which defines progress not as a slow progress forward, but as a never-ending power struggle. Amazingly, things got worse. In 2016, Brianna Foz and Michael Carger published Women's Studies as a Virus. This is no joke. They compared women's studies, critical pedagogy, and similar ideologies to viruses, and did so favorably. AIDS, Ebola, SARS, and even cancer are listed as role models for women's studies. Viral attacks have been proposed to cause cancer, autoimmune disorders, and neurological disease. In this sense, the virus may work as a powerful metaphor for women's studies pedagogical practices. Rather than simply inducing harm among its victims, viruses can also represent transformative change. They even compare conservative movements like men's rights or post-feminism to a body's immune system and say that those need to be suppressed. These movements seek to essentially reaffirm the need for the patriarchal status quo. Collectively, these institutional and popular responses represent the corporate university's immune response to the imposition of the feminist virus. Anti-feminist, post-feminist, and men's rights organizations represent, metaphorically, the protective T-cells and cytokines that seek out and dismantle threatening critical pedagogical invaders. The students of women's studies need to go out and infect other industries like a virus would. In doing so, we frame two new priorities for women's studies training male students as viruses, and embracing negative stereotypes of feminist professors. In 2019, Ibram X. Kendi published both How to Be an Anti-Racist and Pass an Anti-Racist Constitutional Amendment. The former is famous for the idea that past discrimination is only fixed by present discrimination, and present discrimination is only fixed by future discrimination. But the focus here will be on the latter. Kendi asserts that the presence of inequality is evidence of racial policy, not people, policy. His amendment to the Constitution would permanently establish the Department of Anti-Racism to fix said policy. The DOA would oversee all federal, state, and local policy to ensure racism isn't present. Also, the amendment would make racism over a certain threshold and the racist thoughts of public officials illegal. To fix the original sin of racism, told you it was a Christian heresy, Americans should pass an anti-racist amendment to the U.S. Constitution that enshrines two guiding anti-racist principles. His misspelling, not mine. Racial inequity is evidence of racist policy, and the different racial groups are equals. The amendment would make unconstitutional racial inequity over a certain threshold, as well as racist ideas by public officials with racist ideas and public official clearly defined. 2019 also saw Kimberly Crenshaw appear again with her book, Seeing Race Again. In wonderful candor, Crenshaw said that meritocracy, a pillar of Western civilization, stood outside the system of power, and therefore it didn't support the racial revolution. This essay revisits the history of how critical race theory emerged as an intellectual response to colorblindness in the context of institutional struggles over the scope of equality and the content of legal education. Institutional actors from across the political spectrum embraced a gradualist strategy of integration of CRT into society, premised on the assumption that the colorblind meritocracy stood outside of the economic and racial power. A cursory reading of any of the post-2010 works mentioned here will reveal how blatantly they admit their craziness. CRT continued to push into all aspects of America. In 2019, the Southern Baptist Convention passed Resolution 9 at their annual convention which, though it claimed the misuse of CRT was the problem, still allowed the use of CRT in SBC churches. In 2020, the state of Washington implemented CRT into government, a new and scary step. The State of Washington Office of Equity Task Force, 
forged their final proposal for outlining their goals and duties. They blatantly claimed the desire to disrupt and dismantle the current American system of oppression. Their goal was to make equity work everyone's work, so no one is really safe from ideology. They also have a focus on inclusion and belonging. These words don't mean what they seem to mean to average people. Inclusion. The notion that an organization or system is welcoming to new populations and or identities. This new presence is not merely tolerated but expected to contribute meaningfully into the system. New populations and identities here are marginalized groups. Toleration refers to repressive tolerance, so supporting strictly leftist policies and people. Inclusion is therefore the welcoming in of decidedly Marxist or leftist ideologues. From Pragya Agrawal in Belonging in the Workplace, A New Approach to Diversity and Inclusivity, the intention is not to focus on trying to hire people who will fit into workplace culture or support the employee in fitting into existing workplace culture at the cost of their own identity. The idea is not to ignore differences but to normalize how we discuss and talk about them. The idea is that everyone is different and they are equal. Inclusion and belonging were apparently needed to address racialized trauma in Washington. Marginalized groups needed to feel actively welcome, meaning that the goalposts will always be moved. Because how can you fully control someone's feelings of belonging from the outside? You can't. More recently, some schools have implemented policies to remove Fs or Ds from the grading scale, or to allow no grades to dip below 50% to help out marginalized students. This makes a mockery of minority education. Restorative justice is the idea that discipline of racial minorities should be forgotten in order to make up for the supposed school-to-prison pipeline. Modern climate justice claims that the U.S. contributes largely to pollution, and other countries are poorly affected by it, so the U.S. needs to take in refugees as reparations. Brigham's and Women's Hospital in Boston is a teaching hospital that is initiating policies to give preferential care to racial minorities. BLM attacked the nuclear family and supported all manner of CRT movements. The founders, Patrice Cullors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi, received most of the donation money for themselves. And lastly, like I foreshadowed earlier, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture put out an infographic on whiteness a few years ago. This needs to be taken apart in detail so you understand exactly what is being attacked. In order, the aspects of whiteness are rugged individualism, meaning being individualistic, self-reliant, independent, or autonomous. Family structure, meaning the nuclear family. Emphasis on scientific method, meaning objective, rational thinking, and cause and effect relationships. History, meaning Northern European ancestry, the British Empire, and Western Judeo-Christian tradition. Protestant work ethic, meaning hard work, delayed gratification, and goal setting. Religion, meaning Christianity and monotheism. Status, power, and authority, meaning focusing on wealth, career, respect, and ownership of goods and property. Future orientation, meaning future planning, optimism, and progress. Time, meaning rigid time schedules and time being viewed as a commodity. Aesthetics, meaning European beauty, bland food, etc. Holidays, meaning Christian holidays and white male leaders being celebrated. Justice, meaning English common law, protection of property, and innocence before guilt. Competition, meaning focusing on winning, assertiveness, decision making, and majority rules. Communication, meaning the King's English, Western writing traditions, and politeness. They are pretty astonishing, and you might wonder where they came from, until you see the citation that was later hidden. The one that directly cites Judith Katz and the challenge of diversity. Of the major leaders in these movements, who truly stands opposed to white culture, and who is actually complicit? Let's take a look. Judith Katz herself put in a lot of hard work to publish her books, so she's out. Pat Vidal must have followed rigid time schedules at some point in her career. Bye. Robin D'Angelo is white. Oops. On a side note, I think white fragility is really just about her. There's a term in religion called scrupulosity. It's characterized by pathological guilt or anxiety about morality. Essentially, it's the feeling that one is never good enough, or is never doing enough. It can be a form of OCD, and Robin may have it, but for critical race theory. Read her book and keep an eye out for projection. You will find it. 
Ibram X. Kendi certainly cares about wealth, which is part of whiteness. Oh well. Kimberly Crenshaw has no problem being a respected authority in the CRT movement. Sounds like a dissident to me. Gloria Ladston Billings must have been future-oriented when she planned the future of CRT. Bad Marxist. Patrice Cullors values authority as the head of BLM. Guess she's not black anymore. Angela Davis actually has white ancestors, so she has reparations to pay. Betty Friedan was certainly very individualistic in her feminist efforts. Out. Herbert Marcuse was a white man, so forget about it. Max Horkheimer and his theories used cause and effect relationships a lot. Bye bye. Antonio Gramsci not only recognized white culture, but wanted to work within it to beat it. Terrible. Karl Marx was very European. That's not good enough. George Hegel used rational thinking in his theories, even though he denounced rational thinking. White. You see, none of these people are good enough even by their own standards. What will happen in the future is what always happens. The tippy-top people in the movement will purge literally everyone else until they're the only ones left or they die. And then the movement will collapse, just like the USSR. The only question is, how many people will die before that happens? Knowing that all these voracious, insidious, viral ideologies are out there and are out for blood, what can be done to stop them? The first step is knowing what's going on, and you've just done that. The second step is simply resisting. Marxism in its various forms has been rampaging through America since the mid to late 19th century, and has only met real opposition in the last five years. Think about that. More than 120 years to grow a monster and it's already crumbling. Where George Orwell was wrong in 1984 was that he assumed the state would live on in evil forever. It won't. It will always be ended or end itself. Hopefully it can be ended in America before it really begins. Here are some things to do and to support. Do not use their terms against them. Terms like diversity, equity, and inclusion are co-opted and corrupted, as are critical theory, racism, justice, dignity, belonging, power, whiteness, etc. Really, use these terms with caution and always verify the definition. Otherwise, use different terms because they will outplay you in linguistics. See this video to understand how to speak woke. An example, don't bother with Christian nationalism, even if you want some kind of theonomy, which personally I don't support. Using phrases like Christian nationalism is playing into a trap. Have you heard of the book called Beautiful Trouble? It's been called the updated Rules for Radicals by Saul Alinsky. When considering action, that is, the things that bring real change, the handbook, Beautiful Trouble, says the real action is your target's reaction. This means real change is made when the opposition to wokeness falls into the trap. Christian nationalism is a trap, since the term has already been socially engineered to mean white supremacy. Marjorie Taylor Greene fell into that trap. Don't make that same mistake. Take a look at the Social Justice Encyclopedia from NewDiscourses.com. It's an invaluable resource to really understand the terms and where they come from. Support the basic American message of e pluribus unum. It means, from many, one. Meaning, many people truly come together to make one country. Critical diversity means, from one, many. Which aims to split people up into arbitrary groups and pit them against each other. Think about it. If the masses are fighting over race, no one will call out the rich and powerful who are actually doing exploitation. Read Abuse of Language, Abuse of Power by Joseph Pieper. Expose the abuse of language that Marxists do. Sadly, you may also have to become some form of an activist. The golden years of American luxury are gone. It's time to do the dirty work and save this country. You might just be able to stand up and say, I don't know about all this stuff. That's enough. That will do. But don't stand there and do nothing. Promote and enforce accountability. There are stories of leftist employees asking their CEOs to initiate DEI or to do racial hiring. The CEO accepts and puts the burden on the leftists. He tells them, go ahead and do that. If you can hire X amount of people by X date, you get a promotion and a new title. Otherwise, you're fired. Weeks later, the leftists quit. Accountability is anathema to Marxism. Know your rights. Study the Constitution and basic law in America. Study the bylaws of your local school board. Hold them to account. Stand up and speak. Bring a friend. Build groups. Don't go alone or critical race theory will swallow you whole. Ask your leftist friends this. 
If the CRT stuff keeps progressing, at what point would you say, that's too much? At least get them thinking about it even if they don't give you an answer. Harvard is currently in the midst of an anti-Asian discrimination court case that puts affirmative action on trial. A win for the Asians could overturn the decision made in Gooder versus Bollinger, which would be huge. Support that case. At the beginning, I said that this story begins and ends with Christianity. And then, save for Hegel and the Trinity, I pretty much didn't really touch it again. Well, here's the ending. This all began with the Christian heresy, and the activists now are literally professing their disdain for Christianity specifically, and their desire for its downfall. So of course, the correct response is to support what they attack. They only attack what they think is a threat, and Christianity is at the top of that list, really. Who would want to be accountable to God if they could instead do whatever they want and never face consequences? Even if you aren't Christian, you can agree with this. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The antidote to communism is discernment and accountability. Luckily, Christians have been practicing discernment for 2,000 years, and the Jews for far longer than that. Judeo-Christian tradition is uniquely poised to undo the evil done by communism in America, and strong, effective, attractive leadership is needed in churches and synagogues, as well as in family, media, education, and law. You must resist. Like Benjamin Franklin wrote so long ago, join or die. That isn't the threat. Either you join the resistance to evil, or the evil will kill you. Your choice. Some watching may have objections to my thoughts, research, terminology, etc. I aim to answer some of those ahead of time here. You're biased. Yes, I am. I am biased against evil ideas. Do you want to support evil ideas? You're racist. I just spent an immense amount of time explaining the history of critical race theory. That won't work on me. You're a hateful Christian bigot. Again, the words you use against me are falsely defined by activists. Try again. Don't force your morality on me. Two things. One, you clicked on the video. Two, that statement is a moral statement. You think I ought to do otherwise than I'm doing. Don't be a hypocrite. Stop doxing these people. They are public figures, and I have used only the information they published themselves. No doxing here. You're taking the words out of context. I've given long quotes from various books and articles, not snippets. I've also provided all the links for said articles and books. Check for yourself. Be accountable. That's not what socialism means. Socialism is group ownership of the means of production. Historically, that group has been the government. Groups are not private, they are public. The word public comes from the Latin word publicus, which means of the people or of the state. Denying this is denying the long history of people who support this definition. That's not what wokeness is. This video is a comprehensive history, not an exhaustive one. There are many other persons and writings that contributed to woke culture, and much more can be said on that. However, my aim here was to educate people on the general Marxist history of wokeness and to inspire them to stand up against it. I'm trying to consolidate a conformity among the American people uh, in opposition to what was called communism in those days. Today it's called woke. But in those days, it was called communism. Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. Yes, they should. They aren't supposed to be absorbed in it, but it's politics that allow for freedom of religion, and letting that freedom go to waste is tragic. I spent a lot of time making the script for this video and checking all the quotes and references for accuracy but the majority of the research done for this historical account was done by James Lindsay of The New Discourses. In fact, these two workshops and this podcast episode form the foundation for this entire video and are far more in depth. My goal here was to be concise and efficient. Watch these workshops multiple times for the full information. There was also a long video on Hitler's socialism by TIK History that informed the small section I had on him. Check that out too. While I was recording this video, the Lotus Eaters podcast released a video on the origins of wokeness. It aligned very nicely with this history and stands as a more casual understanding of the topic, which is more easily shareable. I recommend you watch that video and share it with your friends. I have a ton of references and notes for this video. 
The references are in the description along with the full list of literature I referred to during the video, in order. Thank you for sticking around this whole time. This video is wildly different from any other I've ever made, but I felt the inspiration to share it with you because I believe this is the greatest modern challenge Christianity faces. I don't think any challenge can overcome Jesus Christ, of course, but the church needs great encouragement, and Christians should get back into the spirit of sacrificial love of which we in the West have long been deprived. We need to use our resources to defend those who can't defend themselves intellectually, spiritually, or physically. To dispel a leftist term, this isn't a call to violence, nor an alt-right dog whistle, even though they'll say that anyway. Also, though I've never asked for likes, subscribes, or money in any way on this channel, I will say that any support you give me is greatly appreciated. Even though I've met the requirements for monetization, YouTube has not monetized my channel, and I have a feeling this video would never be monetized anyway. If you feel inspired to support me financially, then you can do that here. I hope this video inspires you as much as James Lindsay inspired me, and I'll see you next time.